this is, this is, this is. Man, how long has it been, gents? <laughs> you guys, two years, huh? two years. That's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, Jack, Christian, Christian, Jack, welcome back. <laughs> Good to have you guys. Um, the Love Breakers, man, we got a lot to talk about. I want to hear all about it. Uh, last time we talked, you guys were going to be going on a tour with Social Distortion. You were going to be, you had all these plans. You had your new album out, um, Primary Colors, and and now you have a new record coming. So let's get into it. Where do we want to start? That's the question. Um, I think last time we spoke, we just released, um, or we were coming up to releasing Primary Colors, and obviously the Social Distortion tour. Yeah. had been postponed a few years um so i guess we should maybe start with the social distortion tour because yeah we were waiting for that for a while and uh yeah it, when it came around it was it was it was special so do you want to start with start with it jack <laughs> yeah man so like um where can we begin sort of last last sort of may we were sort of getting ready for the tour so yeah. um we were sort of doing like a lot of local shows just to get a sort of reaction from people about what the new songs that were that we were writing. So um, it was a chance for us to get that kind of reaction and how we thought it might go down on tour and how we sort of felt playing these new songs live as well. So um, yeah, we sort of experimented a little bit doing those little shows, and then when the tour come round. We kind of had like a solid set list that we played every night, which was sort of songs of primary colours and a few new ones sort of in as well. But um, but yeah, it's like we started our first show in Milan and then the whole tour was like seven weeks and it's quite sort of difficult to get through everything because there were so many shows. There was like about 30, I think, off the top of my head. And, um, and yeah, it was just like an incredible experience to sort of play in those big sort of venues and obviously with a band that we absolutely love so yeah. you know you you're meeting people who you've listened to since i was a teenager which was incredible breathing the same air as mike ness it's not a bad situation That's <laughs> That's yeah I, I feel the same way you know he's like punk rock royalty to me um another state of mind you know it all started with that, you know, and then somewhere between heaven and hell and like th those albums um, and then social distortion, social distortion, like, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a huge influence on me personally. So that experience, what did you take away from that, you guys? Like, was there uh, any influence in any ways, not just songwriting, maybe, but anything? Yeah. So like you sort of watch, watching them every night, you realize how sort of slick and professional everything is and how like everything sort of flows and i don't know it, it, ma it makes you realize like yo you got you got to up your game you know so i felt like you know you, you think you're good don't you but like everyone's confident in themselves to a degree you've got to be to be able to get on stage and perform to people but when you watch mike ness johnny two bags brent and fucking dave hidalgo jr go up every night you realize oh actually man i gotta step my shit up. do you know what i mean yeah <laughs> so it was it was really inspiring, man. It was really inspiring. Um, there's so many cool like memories, but I remember we obviously got there. Um, we were watching Social Distortion sound check, and then the nerves started to kick in because we we didn't get a sound check. There was like a local band opening the show, so we didn't get a sound check. So we were a little bit nervous. So I remember we went on stage, sort of, you know. You're always nervous about how it sounds out front and how your monitors are going to sound when you don't get a sound check. The show went really well. And then we come off stage and um, I remember it was like a big outdoor show and we had like porter cabins as dressing rooms and outside our dressing room there was like a load of bean bags. So we were all sat there and Mike Ness comes walking over. At this point, we haven't like introduced ourselves because, you know, you don't want to tread on their toes too early. Do you know what I mean? Right. It comes bowl <laughs> bowling over. And uh, introduces himself, and we're all like, yo. And he's like, man, I heard you guys, you know, I heard you guys playing while I was doing my punch bag routine. He was like, your songs are great, man. Like, And we were like, whoa, that, that's great, man. And uh, he saw our guitarist was playing a gold top, a Gibson Les Paul gold top. And uh, oh, yeah. 
he, he was like, let, let, <laughs> yeah, he was like, let, let me have a go on that. So Chino, our guitar player, he's like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> have a go, have a go. So he's there noodling away. Mm-hmm. We just hang out. Like, it was really, really cool. And all of them really made us feel at home and put put their arm around us and didn't, you know, it was all really comfortable and like, it's weird when you're playing with your heroes because you, you, you know, you're worried. You think you, you can overthink it. You can be like, damn, I don't want to get in the way or whatever. But they really sort of took us under their wing and were really polite and, and yeah, and humble. So there's so many cool stories. It, sort of, life. it kind of like kind of set the tone for the tour, didn't it? Because it was that kind of natural, you know, when Mike come over and then like the rest of them come over and it was just like a really cool, natural conversation. It wasn't sort of too forced. It wasn't us being like sort of fanboys going, we love you. <laughs> it was like just sort of, you know, playing our guitars. And yeah, when they were sound checking as well, it was quite weird because we was in like this big sort of open air arena place. And um, they had like an LED wall behind them and they were testing out all the different graphics and stuff. And then throughout their whole sound check, it said love breakers behind them. <laughs> and we were going, man, like that's that's surreal to have like <laughs> social D on stage playing like, you know, the songs that we know. And then it just got our sort of, our Love Breakers logo behind them, which was quite funny. It's wild, man. It's wild. Yeah, I love it. So is it like, is it a bit like your first flight somewhere ever in your life and you get first class, you know, and they're just like pampering you? And so is that going to like, are you guys back to like reality a bit, like doing your own shows? Like, um, obviously you guys have, have played pubs, you've played probably parties and, you know, whatever, you know, but uh, that had to be just a surreal moment. And it, if anything, it makes you work hard. Like, hey, we got to step up our game so we can get back to these kinds of tours, stay with these kinds of tours, you know. And what's, uh, you know, are you guys now the Social Distortion World Tour house band? Or is it, you know, is it, <laughs> are you guys going to move on? That, that, that's the dream, mate. That's the dream. But it is like a bit of a step back to reality because we just did our first um, – we just did our first headline tour and the last night was in Birmingham, which is our home city. And they haven't even paid us yet. And it's been over a month. <laughs> oh, uh oh, uh oh. Somebody better go back down there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's different, you know? Um, but you know, it's like being, in, being in, you guys know this, even in the, in the short time you've been a band and doing this, you know, it's been what are you now like four or five years old as a band? Uh, what, what do you consider? Yeah, just over five years. Yeah. Five years. Yeah, I mean that's great, by the way, and and it's been, man, tumultuous in the world. It's been insane. So to be doing as well as you guys are, I'm impressed because there's a lot of distractions. But you guys, really, the way to do it is just to focus, never give up. Um, I love that, man. So let's get into this new album you guys got coming out. You have a new song out. It's called Spark. Um, great song. And I really feel like I've had a chance to listen to maybe half the album, but six songs you guys had on your pre previews or whatever for me. Um, man, all the songs work so well together. You know, like it's a cohesive group of songs. It's it to me. I feel like you picked up where you left off on your last album. Um, it's is there is there what was the stretch for you guys making your second record? Was it was there any tension? Was it easy? Was it, what was the process? Yeah, I think, um, cause due to sort of lockdown, there was a lot of sort of bands in our areas kind of like falling by the wayside and thinking, you know, we can't, we can't do this anymore because of, we can't play show and get together. Whereas we sort of looked at it as let's try and stay productive as possible. So we, um, we started doing pre-production for the new record basically in COVID. And we were like, I was sort of creating, you know, like acoustic demos and doing stuff from home and then sending it to the guys. Mm -hmm. And then they were sort of adding their bits and we were just doing it sort of remotely, basically, just to try and try and keep it going. And um, in that sort of time, we got a new drummer as well. So um, when we went into the studio, it was completely different from when we did Primary Colours. And... um, we recorded at a studio in Watford as well in the UK, which was a lot different to coming out to sort of Costa Mesa and doing it out in the sunshine. It was a bit of a different experience, but I think um, 
but this time round, it was like it was so it was so like positive, and we did it in a way where we wasn't like tracking the the songs like individually. We were kind of set up so like Christian and Nathan, our drummer and the and Christian the bass player was in like a separate live room, and then like me and Chino the guitarist was playing along in the control room, and it just felt like it was a, li- a little bit more. It like captured a different energy to doing it sort of so loud, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And yeah. um I feel like it, it feels yeah, like a band, like tra- right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it sort of everyone stays involved today. There's no one sort of like waiting around to sort of play the parts and stuff. And I think I think that sort of comes across on the record that it was a real good like team effort. And I think um we spent a lot of time like doing a lot of post production stuff as well, like adding a lot of like synth sounds and horns and piano and we've all really got involved with it because of of lockdown we couldn't really do anything else so it was sort of yeah we all just sort of you know like chipped in and involved with it so what kind of so how how put together are the songs when you guys start hitting the studio for recording are you still working out parts or are you changing things or is it like no we know exactly what we're doing I don't know how how loose it is, but um, what was that? What's that it's, like? It's like so. We when we went in with Davey for Primary Colors, it was a bit more like he was like sort of pulling the songs apart, and then you know, oh, you don't need you know ch- taking the fat off basically. And sure, then I sure. feel like with this, I feel like with his second record, we sort we sort of learnt from that, and maybe it was that we did learn from it and the songs didn't need any fat taken off them. But when we went in, Mitch, who was producing the record was like every song, like we went through them, we played through them a few times and we had them all demoed. And when we went and played them to him live in the, in the studio, it was like, nothing needs to change. Nothing needs to change. And I, I think that is because of what we learned from Davey. We, we made the songs. Definitely. Yeah. There was no fat yeah. on any of them. And, and so we went in and everything was there. It was just, as Jack said, it was a case of once the songs were recorded and the, and the bass, drums, guitars, the vocals were done, it was just a case then of adding, you know, like the, the organs and the synths and any extra sort of bits of production that we could think of to sort of fatten, the, fatten them out and make them sound interesting. Because um, a lot of the, the stuff we're really into, like as much as like Tom, you know, like Tom Petty, Green Day, a lot of that stuff... It's pretty simple, like rock and roll. It's not overly like layered, but I think these days you have to, even for ourselves, it's about keeping it sounding interesting. And I think music has changed so much. Like that recent Paramore record, like I'm not, I've never been like the biggest fan, but this latest record, Jack actually said to me, "Listen to it, listen to it." And I've listened to it, and it's incredible. And I think it's because of the amount of time I sort of spent on it, and I did loads of sort of extra elements. So. Yeah, so to, to answer the question, yeah, like it, the song, the songs were already there, ready done. Um, but yeah, it was like a case of afterwards, just sort of adding, you know, some extra spice to them, I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah, man. It was like sort of stepping up. It was like stepping up our game. It was like the process was still the same. It was me sort of with an acoustic guitar, giving it to the guys. You know, like eighty percent, ninety percent finished, and then we'd sort of work on it together in terms of getting, you know, like different structures and. And then again, just making it sound interesting, just all sort of chipping in, really. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, do you guys get in the room together too before, like, and work out songs? And that's how you're cutting the fat, like face. Exactly. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's straight yeah. up. That's that's like the Beatles, yeah. like the Beatles did, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny. Yeah, actually, yeah. Cause, <laughs> it's funny because um, it was all it, well. While you were demoing Jack, like Jack was doing demos, it was like the middle of lockdown, so we couldn't really do anything. But then, like, obviously with Garage Band and stuff, um, once he'd done the acoustic demo, Jack would set up like a, a Garage Band demo, send us all over the Garage Band demo. Then we'll, we'd all add our own stuff like that. And then when it did come to everything opening up and us being allowed to hang out, we were already rehearsed, so we could go in. And it was really quite awesome, actually, because we'd all played the songs in front of our laptops but we'd never right. played them together. So we'd go in and we'd be like, right, isolation summer, bam. And it was like, Jesus, like, we're all killing it. Like, and it's because we'd been playing it over the laptop. Um, but yeah, man, it was, uh, it's the li- lyrically as well, like with this record, if you listen, like a lot of it is about being, it's from lockdown period, isn't it? Like a lot of it is like about being stuck inside and 
you know, waiting to get out into the open world. So. And here we are, sort of, yeah, man. sort of out in the open world. <laughs> Things are different, though. Yeah. <laughs> Things are different. Yeah, I mean, that's what they say is like anytime, anytime somebody's having like mental health issues or whatever, they always say go outside, go out into the into nature, go take a walk. And if you can't get outside, if you're locked in a room, man, it just drives you crazy, right? Like that's, it's like the sort of a a mathematical equation where it's like that's that's what we've we've experienced um have you guys felt that too like when you get out you like going outside they they say the young youngsters say touch grass that's it i mean i think you've got i think you i think you've got better um I think you've got better surroundings where you are up on the yeah you're on the northwest no <laughs> northwest don't you whereas in Birmingham you walk around and you sort of look up at the gray skies and the gray buildings and the smog in the air you're sort of like I yeah. want to go back inside now <laughs> I mean our weather isn't that different but I, I understand the yeah. the look what was it so you guys both grew up in Birmingham or or what was that like it's just outside when it so Jack is like North Birmingham yeah, yeah. um. Well, Jack and Nathan, our drummer, are in North Birmingham, and then me and Chino are like sat South Birmingham. So it's all right. It's not bad, to be fair. It's just suburbia. There's just nothing to do. Has it I mean? changed? So. Has it changed from childhood to now much? Not really. It just gets really? grayer. Really? It just gets <laughs> yeah. grayer. I, that's crazy because, like, you know what's funny is, like, a lot of people – would say that about their hometowns, but I, I kind of feel the, the opposite. Like there are things about Bremerton that are the same, but mostly all the buildings are sort of like slowly but surely turning over new bit, you know, different business. This business goes out of, you know, and that new buildings going up here in Waco, Texas. So like, I feel like maybe England's just different. Maybe it's just different. Like, if things aren't, is there's no think, construction happening over there? There is. I think I we're think just jaded, sort of, mate. Uh, over the past, <laughs> I think sort of like over the past like five to ten years, there's been like a lot of startup businesses. Like it's quite the sort of government do support like young people who want to start businesses in terms of like pop up shops and all that kind of stuff. And that's really kind of like common in London. There's a lot of places where like the shops are absolutely tiny, but they cram like ten into a block. And I think, like, it's quite interesting because, obviously, it happens in London first and then it goes, like, the surrounding areas. They start to do it. And I think um, that's what I've kind of noticed over the past five to ten years on how how it's changed in our like, local towns and cities, that there's a lot more sort of independent stores, which I love. Yeah. I You know, that that just sparks a thought in, in me. And... Is clear, correct me if I'm wrong. You guys don't really talk about political issues in your songs. It's more about like life, what's going on. I mean, but sometimes politics kind of enters into life. Like, have you ever done that? Yeah. Not not personally, Mike. It's it's something that I've never really got into because I just feel like too comfortable. <laughs> yeah, you're not so, sure what to stand, what to put your stance on. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's the thing, like, I've never been interested in a certain party or anything like that because it's when new parties come in and take control, nothing kind of really changes. So it's hard for me to put my my effort into having, like, a strong belief about something that doesn't really change. So, um, right, right. So, yeah, a lot of our songs are sort of, like, social commentaries on either stuff that's happened to me or stuff that's happened around me, but it's more to do with, like, sort of people and and personalities rather than sort of like political statements really yeah you guys got some crazy politics so so do we to be fair but I mean, <laughs> you guys got crazy politics over the summer i mean your your economy kind of went crazy like is that it's depressing, getting mate. any better is that getting better tell me it's getting better it's a I I I I switch off from it because I feel like <laughs> okay, yeah. everybody's switching literally, off. Right now. <laughs> yeah, like you can literally lose your mind. Like it's it's just it's quite scary, and it? it's like like Jack said, I I don't trust anyone, so I'm just like I just listen to music, and music's like my form of like escapism. Yeah, um, yeah. And like I, I love political bands. Like Jack's a big Rage Against the Machine fan, and I grew up listening to like Anti Flag. I used to really like them, and mm -hmm. um. 
but don't say you me, used like, to I'm... like them. Come on. <laughs> no, I, 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 no, I mean, I used to listen to that. I haven't I got listened you, to I got in a while. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, man, like, I, you know, I, I'm, I I'm with you. them. I with, I'm with them on what they stand for. But as I've got older, I've become a little bit more jaded. And, like, I feel like I need positivity to sort of, the world's fucked. I don't, I don't want to hear it. I know it's fucked. I don't want to hear it anymore about how fucked it is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I just want to. Yeah. Try and enjoy yeah. myself in the little time that I've got here. Yeah, I, so. believe me, I, I I hear you exactly. Because over the pandemic, I did not really talk about the pandemic. We talked about everything but. We talked about music, like you were saying. Like, um, you know, we talked a little bit about, like, how's tour, how do you think touring is going to go? Or should we get, like, bubble suits and go into the, the audience? <laughs> you know, that was kind of fun. <laughs> but, I mean, but overall... I, I totally get um, what you're saying, and I, I feel like MXPX, even though we have had political songs, I feel like looking back, even though I stand by those political songs, that was a tight rope, like a, a tight rope as far as like it could have gone either way. I feel like because of how things have gone with wars and the industrial complex, I'm good. I was right about my songs, Americanism and other things like that. But uh, But these days, yeah, it's a little, it's trickier. There's so much misinformation and I feel like staying positive is what a lot of people want to listen to MXPX for with when I listen to Love Breakers you guys talk about it's feel good rock and roll right and yeah man. I respect that I respect that you just like okay this is what we're going for yes it doesn't mean we are ignoring the world and we're, we're not acknowledging that the world is fucked up but we got to stay positive, stay productive. Like you said earlier, staying productive, that's staying positive. If, 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 mm. if I'm depressed, I'm not doing as much. I'm not being productive in the world. And if I'm, if I'm listen, if I listen to a song and it gets my mood up, I start working and I start doing things productively. So like, I, I feel <laughs> like music really is a medicine. It's like an anecdote 100%. For, for all this. I feel like yeah, it's, like, it's, 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 it's for your, like, your mindset at the time, isn't it? Like fans can sort of, you know, affect you in different ways. Like we've just mentioned, like Rage Against the Machine. If like, if someone's in a mind space where they want to just fucking punch someone and <laughs> oh, I don't know, it's like, you know what I mean? Like it, it's kind of, it's, it's all, it's all relative in it. And I think with our band, it's like, as Christian said, like we listen to music for an escapism. And I, I, like, I like the thought of people coming to our shows just to have a really good time get on with people and just sort of just have fun. And I think like, you know, our songs, I personally think like that's what we aim, we, that's what we aim to do to make people feel good. And I think, um, but yeah, there's loads of other bands out there that make you sort of react in different ways. And it is, it is still good. Like I've, I've gone to see bands in the past and to get more rage out and I felt great after it. So it's, um, yeah, different bands for different mindsets. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hate breed is here for a reason. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like as well, without getting too deep, I feel like the real pandemic as well, that's well, has been around for ages, is it, mental health, man. I do feel like, and when, when you're feeling low, all you have to do is put on like one of your favourite records. And the lyrics could mean absolutely nothing. They could be the most dumbest lyrics ever. And if it makes you feel good, it's done its job. Do you know what I mean? And it's put, put you in a better place. Absolutely. So, yeah. so I think like, yeah, man, like there's a, there's a spot for political bands. There's a spot for bands who just want to sing about, you know, having a good time and just, you know, you know, staying positive. I think that's such an important thing these days. You know, it's funny. That. You know, it's funny, Christian, even, you know, bands that sing about hate, sing about, you know, negativity, they probably get like a positive charge from like jamming a new song or playing a great show. And it's like bringing positivity to their lives, to their fans lives. And obviously, like, it's a spectrum of, you know, negative, positive or whatever. I choose to be positive because that's the type of people I am. But there's got to, you know, there's people out there that get that positive charge from the negativity. So uh, we see you two. Do your thing. All good. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Cover all bases, man. <laughs> Absolutely. That That's... That's music. Uh, I was listening to a, I don't know how I stumbled across this, but it was like a song that was engineered to 
relieve your stress and to put you in a calm state and, you know, maybe even like relieve your migraine or something like that. And I'm like, what is this song going to sound like? Is it going to be like, uh, 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 staying alive? No, probably not. <laughs> but I, I, I looked it up and it was just like, you know, like hundreds of other sleep type songs, yoga type, just, you know, like synth and not really a melody. It was nice, uh, you know. And so it just got me thinking like, what the hell, man? People go deep into the science of this stuff. And, and I'm sure that it probably works and, and somewhat works based on sometimes a placebo effect. You know how like your mind, I, you know, I really believe in placebo effects for some things because your mind is so strong. It thinks you're sick and it thinks you're getting well based on this, you know, whatever pill, right? That the same could be for happiness and, and all that. Like we can give ourselves this placebo effect and it, and it becomes real. You know, it's a spectrum. No, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, when, when we were on tour, we, um, our friend Leo came out with us and he did like, um, he did some like session musicianing for us. So we'd do like a bit of harmonies, tambourine and stuff. Okay. And when I was, when I was sharing a hotel room with him, it was, the, I've never experienced this before, but he, would put on his phone all night with like um the sound of rain. Yeah, yeah, and like I, I, the, fir the first night it was like, hope you don't mind. I have this on my like my phone to help me sleep, and I was like, oh dude, that's so annoying. And he was like, no, trust me, give it a chance. <laughs> and, it, I, and so mm. I swear to God, I had the best night's sleep ever. It was incredible. So most nights on that tour when I was sharing a room with him, I got a really really good night's sleep, and that it really worked. I don't I don't understand it. But it yeah. was like, yeah, it was it was really like relaxing and like de-stressing. It was amazing. I'll tell you my brief journey into, you know, because, uh, you know, it doesn't have to take too long. But it started with fans, like having fans on and drowning out outside noises on tour or on the bus, something like that. Um, and then it turned to, you know, when I had kids, um, we had the sleep, the sleep, uh, the, the kid. I don't know, it's like a, a baby sound machine, right? So it's like so that you don't wake the baby up. It's for them. So I was just like, this is kind of great. And I started using this like sound machine, which is like there's different things you can you can put it on. Shh, you can, you know, have ocean waves yeah, it's like crashing. White, white noise. Yeah, yeah. And so he probably had one of those apps where he could choose different ones, but he chose the forest or wh whatever it was. But I do the same thing. Like I have an air conditioner app. It's, it's a sound app. There's a million different sounds, but the one I use is literally just a, a, like an air conditioner that would be a wall unit. So it's like, oh, wow. it's like a crappy motel air conditioner, and that's how I sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible, man. Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I relate to that completely. So like maybe maybe that doesn't do it for you, that forest sound, but there might be some other crappy air conditioning sound that, that works for people. So if you know, I encourage anybody, go out there and find it. I've talked about it on a, a podcast a while back, just mentioning that I listen to sleep sounds sometimes when I sleep. And eventually I wanted to like actually make my own and release them so that I could listen to them on on uh you know spotify or itunes or whatever uh while i sleep and be making money while i sleep <laughs> that's a great idea that's re that's really smart actually there's definitely yeah. uh, there's definitely like a market for that isn't there so that's really clever yeah yeah, yeah. obviously it's like it's not really going to be a money maker so that's why i don't do it but eventually maybe when i have time it'll be like a hobby hobby thing to yeah do. yeah so <laughs> fun. me and uh, a couple of buddies will do it <clears throat> anyway we can go on and on about this. Let's get back to the the new album. It's called Wonder. I think so. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. So Potentially, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily. <laughs> that that was yeah. that was the work that was the working yeah. title. Um, if I, we I, have I really to cut something it. out, let me know. We can. This isn't live. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, so there isn't a title yet. You haven't decided. I think Wonder is the title. To be fair, we, well, we we have said it is, but I guess like because it's not fully mastered and stuff yet i guess we're still i guess it could change i don't know okay okay well maybe we should cut this part out if you want to 
Unless you want to keep it in and let people debate. It's up to you. That's let cool. me, you can let me know keep later. Keep it in. Keep it in. You have you haven't you have like <laughs> two two days or so to decide. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Wonders. Are, yeah, I think uh, I think Wonders a cool title. Um, Jack, do you want to? That song's quite special special to you, isn't it? That one. Yeah. So um, the title track Wonder, I wrote about my unborn daughter at the time. Mm. So um, it was about when my partner was pregnant, and um, I just kind of come up with like a concept as as if I was sort of talking to my unborn child and the repercussions on what I thought was going to happen after. And um, have you listened to it, Mike? Because as, as Chris sent you, wonder or not? I think he has. Yeah, I think I think it yeah, was on yeah. That list. But um, it's you know, but it was one of them that like it sort of. When I played it, the guys, they were song, kind of like really sort of excited for the new record. It was quite an early song in writing the new ones for the record. But um, but yeah, man, it's just, wow. it's one of them. It's a rocker. It's it's pretty much the same chord progression I threw. It's like four or five chords and it's just a repetitive. It's one of them that you'll know yourself, Mike, when you get a song and you've got the melody, you can write something in like five or ten minutes. And it was, it was one of those. I wrote it really quick and it was just... Yeah getting my thoughts out straight away because I was going through this big sort of this this big life changing moment you know what I mean absolutely yeah I mean I had I kind of had the songs on you know I listened to a couple songs and then I had them on in the background while I was like doing some stuff and so I didn't necessarily catch yeah, the lyrics but I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and listen to that um, you guys just have a way of writing these songs that sound timeless they sound like you guys have been a professional rock band for 20 years, you know, like they sound, they sound just, they sound right. You know, um, that's not easy because people struggle with like just sounding authentic. They, they struggle with being themselves. Obviously I hear, you know, Ramones and Elvis Costello and the clash and green day, you know, I hear influences, but we all have those influences as punk rock, you know, fans, but, you guys have a way of writing songs that do become influenced by that, but your own, you know, that, that I feel like this is love breakers that you guys don't sound like a clone of green day. You might borrow a, a, a style of guitar playing for a song or something like that. But like, I think that's a cool thing actually, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, that's cool. You know, hearing that on top of the timeless songwriting that you guys are doing, man. So, yeah, man. I mean, is it hard to play these songs when 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 they're so personal to you, Jack? Like, is it is it something that you think about? Yeah. Or? It, it's. I think it's the opposite. To be fair, Mike, um, okay. when we was on tour, and we played we played Wonder on the Social D tour actually, and every time I, I played it, I just thought of my daughter, and it was like an amazing moment every night because the song the song starts with me and the guitar on my own. So obviously it's quite a personal for me just to sort of take that, you know, like 10 seconds of me doing the introduction for the song. And, um, and yeah, it just takes me back to that moment where, you know, what we were going through with my partner being pregnant and, you know, all the changes, it just, and it was a happy moment. So it was, it just took me back. It's one of them songs that, you know, personally for me, every time sort of I sing that first line of that song, it just takes me to my daughter's my daughter's face which is an amazing thing that is amazing that's cool all right yeah, well i hope you guys <laughs> Jeez, i mean name the record what you want you know but uh that's, <laughs> you know that's a cool story and, and it translates to so many people's lives you know just not just having kids or anything like that but like when you have something that happens in your life that that changes it forever you know um you know having that <laughs> I think Wonder's a cool title anyway. I think it's a really cool, uh, I don't know, it just sound, it sounds timeless, that word as well. Um, it sounds like... It sounds like quite yeah. sort of mysterious, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cool, man, Wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess that's, that, I think that's an exclusive, actually, Mike, to be honest. I think you've got an exclusive uh -oh. there. I, how, how, did, <laughs> how did I think that? Did I just, like, make that up? Or did I, I thought I read that. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, it probably I think it's out there somewhere. To be fair, um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it. an exclusive, man. It's I might a have just... exclusive. 
<laughs> Sorry, brother. We've got a rat on the inside. <laughs> uh, yeah, someone's leaking information. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Maybe that was maybe you know how nothing nothing's done on accident these days. You That's know, it. like all of a sudden there's a, a a story in the paper. You're like, how did they know that? Uh, leaking <laughs> people. So. It's uh, it's mad. It's it's the album's not even finished yet. We're still uh, really we're still like another. Yeah, so I think those. I think we've got five songs mas- mastered, which you will have, okay. and then the sixth, the sixth one is unmastered and unmixed, and then there's still another like six songs to be mixed and mastered. But as soon as we get them all done, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously get get Chris to send it over to you. Um, but I think it's like a real. Um, I think it's if like cheap trick we're just starting out now fresh yeah like i feel like i feel like that's the sort of i feel like that's the closest band we're, we're to really it's probably like cheap trick because there's loads of cool gu- lead guitar yeah. lines and then and really like catchy hooks and choruses and stuff so yeah man i'm excited for you to hear it i'm excited to hear it myself to be honest because there's still seven songs which i haven't heard yet <laughs> mixed Absolutely. or anything so <laughs> yeah i i had no i guess i you know i find out things on the podcast but I thought that you guys had the record ready to go. So now your backs are against the wall. Like people are going to be yeah. anticipating this album coming out. Is it hopefully later this year? Um, there's so much work to be done in between, you know, having your, you know, recording a record, getting it mixed, mastered, and then actually releasing it. So um, do you guys have plans for, do you have the artwork going? Do you have, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but this is, we need to know. Uh, we need to know. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're not really. I think we've got like concept, like ideas and stuff of like where we want to sort of take it. But um, yeah, there's st- still a lot, still a lot to get done, man. Um, I've learned we, from, from guests like Matt, Matt Collier from the Planet Smashers says you got to get your projects going early get your artwork going when you're recording. And I, of course we didn't do that either for our new record for MXPX, but um, we're still working on everything, you know, but um, it's hard to do. So is there anything that you guys feel like, what is your, aside from the songs, aside from recording and playing live, what is, what else is like what you guys do? Well, it's gotta be one thing. Uh, That's I'm a hard too, question. It's it's hard. Like, how do you mean? Like, what else do we do well? Okay, like, what else you do well? Okay, there could be like marketing, or press, or um, maybe making oh, yeah. videos, or you know, because today yeah, today you have to do so much more to get your name out than just make the good songs and make the, you know, even the good videos. You know, you you know that's just part of it. It's a small. It's it's a, sadly kind of a small part of it. You got to have. I don't know, have some momentum, which I feel like you guys do have. You have, you have, like I said, your backs are against the wall. You have this new song out. What do you do to like keep hyped? I'm asking, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm asking because I'm looking for ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, man, because we're all like... For me, I, I, th- I, th- I think it's the aesthetic in it. I think like, um, I think especially Christian, he's worked really hard on getting an aesthetic so when a stranger sees our like socials or our website it's sort of you know who we are sort of straight away and i think we've tried to do it across the board in terms of like any graphics and sort of how we come across visually we put it into like our live show and all that kind of stuff so it's it's all across the board you don't just see something once and i think in this day and age it's, it's really hard to keep people's attention so i think if you can you know, how you come across on social media, that kind of stuff. It's really important because it's how people are, what will, people will remember you for. And then you've got the music, which is something else. So it, it's kind of, it's not even a balance anymore. I think it's more sort of aesthetic. And then the music comes after for some people. Some people. If they're going to like yeah. follow you or not. You're spot on. I, I, think, I think you guys have a great aesthetic. And I think that is probably your your forte outside of the music and, you know, and do, doing what bands kind of have to do, you know, which is make the music. But um, it's not easy it's for a lot of people. And it's not easy, for, no, even it, if you're doing it well, it's not easy, right? Like, it, it's hard because, like, as well, 
like I see things online, it's like you need to be posting as like much as possible and stuff. And like I'm not 34 necess- years old. Yeah, right. I'm 34, and I, I ain't like we we don't have time Let's to t- like do that shit. Do you know what I mean? It's hard work, man. And to, like you could put something out every day, but you want the quality to be good, so you have to. You have to get it right. Otherwise, I could put a photo yeah. up every day. It could just be like a photo of my guitar sat in the corner of my bedroom. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but no one wants to see that. So it's like, it's such a hard thing to get right. Um, but I feel like, after, again, going back to our favourite bands, it's like a timeless sort of a, like aesthetic that they carry through with the music. And I feel like we've, we've done that well. Um, but it, it, at the same time, it pains me to have to talk about that. But like, but my favourite bands, like The Clash, they had an aesthetic. But when mm-hmm. The Clash did it, it's cool. If you talk about it these days, you're like, oh, you're uncool. But, like, it's so such an important fucking thing to get right. Yeah. So it's a real balancing act, man, especially as you're getting older as well because everyone's got, pro- you know, shit to do. So Absolutely. And I probably – I mean, even me bringing it up is, like, kind of breaking the fourth wall a little bit. Like, wait, what are you talking about? We're just people – we're artists. We make songs. We look like this. We wake up. I look cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we're like, oh, people put thought into like certain things. But I mean, the thing is, is like when you put thought into something, it, it is better. And like just going to the social media thing, I agree with you as I don't even think it necessarily has to do with age, but like a band that unless you're always, always doing something interesting maybe shut up for a minute and, and give it a break. So like, um, but like, and I don't want to tell people what to do, do whatever they want to do. But like, I agree that not everything is super interesting. Some behind the scenes stuff is cool, but ev- you know, you want to see everything? Well, somebody does. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's not a good idea because it just, it just wears you out, you know? And, and eventually you're hearing all these stories about YouTubers, influencers from years ago that are now in their, early 20s they started when they were in their teens and they went through a mental health break and they just they're like i have to step away from posting every day for my mental health and for my health and because i need friends and i've neglected everything else in my life and there is a balance and and you don't have to do that balance always you know you can go hard go hard but realize you can't go hard always and so i feel like that's kind of what i'm doing in my life right now is like if i have something that's interesting i'll post it if i need to pr- promote a show or whatever yeah sure i'm gonna go a little hard on that but like besides that there's no reason to go hard unless you have something to say so and it's and, and like it's going against yeah. like it sounds a bit cheesy but it's going against who we are as people anyway even on our like i don't have a personal instagram jack and the other guys have personal instagrams but they're not they're, they're not consumed by it like Sure. Like Jack doesn't mm. post a fa- Jack barely posts like once a month, like on on a new photo. Same with Nathan. Yeah. I think the last time Nathan posted was six months ago. Same with Chino. So it's like, it's like you know, we don't like to be consumed in it. Obviously, it's important to keep the band one going as much as we can. But yeah, we don't want to just like chuck stuff out there just for the sake of doing it because it, one, it's not it's not us, and two, no one cares anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a, it sort of, it sort of takes the focus it sort of takes the focus off what we want to be and like we just want to I don't know in my head I just want to keep carry on being like a great band, you know rehearsing still being like a great band live yeah like all of the people that we love you know what I mean and just like trying to make the band the best it can be on our social media and how you come across is a part of that mm-hmm. which we're trying to keep on top of but like again no one fucking wants to know what toothpaste. I use and all that kind of shit. It's like, <laughs> that is enough, you know what I mean? It'll never be like that. Google wants to <laughs> and, um, I've got pearly whites out, you know what I mean? I've got pearly whites. <laughs> I love but, it. Um, but yeah, it's a sort of, we want to, you know, there's a little bit of focus there, but our main sort of, our main attention is still on like, the band and the music is the yeah. most important thing to me. I, I may be wrong, but I think people want to hear from you on social media and they would rather hear less and from you than be following your account and have some marketing person be posting pictures of you and videos of you and like yeah. quirky captions and stuff like that. Like not, I, I, like I said, I may be wrong because obviously that works for so many people. And when you're a mega celebrity, I, I mean, honestly, I feel like even if you're a mega celebrity, like a, 
like The Rock or Brad Pitt or whatever, you should probably still do your own social media. At least, and, and at least the um, very personal accounts. You know, not necessarily like all the band stuff, but. Um, that's just me, though. I mean, everybody has their opinion on this. This is like, a, you know, yeah, man. whatever. But I don't know. I, I think the most important thing for me is to come across like authentic. You know what I mean? I think when I see yes. some Instagram accounts, I think they're maybe trying a little bit too hard and it comes across a little bit, you know, like, uh, I, yeah. I don't know if that's like natural. Whereas I think with us, it's it's kind of you see like little clips of us like being stupid and all that kind of stuff because that's who we are we're yeah. not like yeah we're just trying to make it a little bit more sip, personal you sipping know what I mean tea. sipping your tea that's uh, it mate <laughs> sipping tea a few biscuits and that <laughs> so I was watching well my my, uh, my wife and my daughter watch American Idol so I got sucked in I got sucked in <laughs> yeah. the, the new the new uh, new season with Katy Perry and, and it is so funny because they, they talk about Almost every person that they like, they're like, I love your authenticity, you know, and that's what they say every time. <laughs> they, they find words to describe being real. They find words to describe being true or whatever it is, and it always comes down to that. And, and if people are doing a dance or doing choreography, unless it's like absolutely insanely good, they usually pull them out of that and go, I want to see you be just more relaxed, more casual, more real, more raw. And it's like, even for a show like American Idol is obviously not a raw show. Usually it's usually pretty produced in and of itself, but they're producing those raw moments in there, which tells you that's what people want. They want realness. They want authenticity. And here we are watching American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. The irony. The exactly. irony. It's a vicious circle in it, man. <laughs> it's yes, a vicious it is. circle. I yeah. always thought, have you ever thought about d going on one of those shows? Not me personally, because I ain't, I ain't got a great voice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, yeah, and Christian, you'll get on stage and just play like an hour a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do a windmill. <laughs> windmill. Yeah, with your fingers. <laughs> I mean, I always thought yeah. about how ridiculous it would be if, like, punk singers tried to go up and do that because it's just not the same one acapella. We don't usually have the the, yeah. chop, the chops as far as, like, R&B chops. Until, of course, Fall Out Boy, um, Patrick Stump, came along, and then we realized, oh, okay, there's some white boys that can sing then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think for me, like, those kind of shows, when I've seen – what happens to the artist after, say, they win the show. It's like there's only a handful that have gone on to sort mm -hmm. of have control of, like, their own destiny. Like, I see yeah. someone like Harry Styles at the moment who, you know, he's sort of going in the direction that he wants to go in, but it's took him Which how long to get out of that band he was in. The one direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, like, a lot of the, lot of the people who are on there, like, they've got... Yeah, you know, like great voices, but then you see the the career going in a, in a weird direction that they're kind of being controlled on what they what they sing, what kind of style they put out, and I just don't like the idea of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what it what it kind of makes sense to me when I look at the the trajectory of a lot of those shows, like American Idol people. The first couple people kind of got some good traction, like uh, Katie, or no, uh, Kelly Clarkson. Um, Kerry Clarkson. There was yeah. a couple others that actually have had touring careers and went on to do things, but but after a while, it just even if the TV show works, it's it becomes like a niche thing, you know. And that happens to bands all the time. I mean, it, it happens to bands. You know, you you grow for a while, but you try the same thing over and over, and it works until it doesn't work. It happens with like these news agencies. It happens with TV shows. It happens with with a lot of like. It happens with, with ads, like Facebook ads and things like that. You can do the ad until it works, and then one day it just doesn't work or it shuts off or things like that, right? Like that's just part of life. Um, and I feel like those those shows just kind of did the same arc that a lot of things do. So maybe that's a lesson 
as well for us is, you know, just us as artists is just use that momentum. Any trajectory you get, hang on tight. Hang on like Tom Cruise hanging on the side of an airplane. <laughs> I, I feel I feel like I've got a lot of respect as well for like Harry <coughs> Harry Styles. Like I'm losing punk rock points here, but I do actually really <laughs> like his records. Um, I'm actually going to see him live this year. Um, but I feel like he's like, if anything, like he's a lot more rock and roll than a lot of punk bands that are out right now because he's literally just doing. Yeah, like he's putting on a he's putting on a sick show. Like he looks great. He's a great showman. Obviously, it helps that he's good looking, but his songs are badass, and his band is awesome. And he's so and he spit he, on that Chris guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. You guys know about Chris <laughs> Styles Gate or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I don't think he did. I don't think he, he did didn't spit actually on spit on him, but no, it just no, no, looked no. like it looked. It like looks it. like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but, no, um, I think today, again, like it's, his, his, rec- his records sound great. His records yeah. are like really well produced, and okay. the songs are great as well. Like if you if you strip them back and maybe play stick, I can I can really hear like the good songwriting in there. And I think for me, yeah, yeah he's got he's got my respect. Watermelon yeah, yeah, sugar, yeah. sugar watermelon, watermelon sugar. Watermelon the- sugar, yeah. That's catchy. Yeah. That's catchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's okay to like pop stars in this era of punk rock, in this era of rock and roll. Because we're we're introduced to so many things outside our bubbles. Isn't that kind of what it is? We kind of live in these bubbles, whether it's music bubbles, po- political bubbles, cultural bubbles, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I feel like as well, like a, a big thing for me, like when I, when I, I, as much as I love like a club show or, you know, a small punk rock show, like I grew up on that. I love that. But I like a spectacle as well. Like when I go and see a band, I like a spectacle. And like with Harry Styles, like to me, he, he like sings and performs like Freddie Mercury and like Queen, Queen were like badass. You know what I mean? Yeah, and then like, yeah. it's, it's, you can see he's influenced by that and like Bowie and stuff and, and he plays the guitar. Like I've got, I've got respect for him, and I think, I think his songs are cool as well. Um, so, it's he definitely puts on a great show. So I got respect for that. Yeah, I think we find that as the years go on, as we learn about the world, uh, you know, I respect people that do hard things. You know, that they, they do things well, and and whether or not you like Harry Styles' music, he's doing something very well. And, yeah, yeah. And, and I can respect that. You know, same same goes for. For like a you know anybody like a Jay Z that guy does something completely on, on another planet from what MXPX does, but I absolutely respect it. You know it's like okay cool. Um, Taylor Swift not that different from MXPX honestly. Like the songwriting is kind of <laughs> similar. No, but she does great stuff. I mean I really like a lot of her songs and yeah I mean boom. I mean, people that do hard things, um, you got to respect it. Props. And you guys are doing some hard Props. things. You know, mm-hmm. making a record, putting a record together that's actually worth listening to. You know how many records are on Spotify or on YouTube or on, you know, Apple Music, whatever? Millions. And it's hard, to, to man. make it's one hard. that's worth listening to is, yeah, is hard. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, man. It's almost like, like even though, like, everyone... Like, because when in like the early nineties or whatever, or in the eighties, like you sort of record labels were like chucking record deals out at everyone. And I feel like if you were a good band, nine times out of ten, you probably would get found and get a bit of traction. But these days, it's sort of a blessing and a curse because everyone's got like this even platform where I could record a five, I could record like fifteen seconds of a song tonight that means absolutely nothing, and tomorrow it could be on Spotify. And like that sort of saturates the the, the market, yeah. so to speak. So, well, and the, so it's difficult. So like mm-hmm. you can get lost amongst it all. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know if it's good or bad. I think before the internet, it was like an analogy. It would be like there was a lot of paperwork involved with getting to the big time, right? Like you didn't just send mm-hmm. it over the email or whatever. You had to like, okay, we got to go record this thing on tape. Okay, we can't just do it in our bedroom. We got to go to this studio and, you know, pay this money or, you know, whatever it is, right? And then besides that, you have to actually find somebody. You have to do the work, which is, usually means playing a bunch of shows, 
um, to get noticed by another band that has an, uh, a manager that might be like, oh, I want to manage these guys too. Then they get you signed. So it was like, there was like a process to getting signed. Nowadays, yeah, there's a process, but it's like there's a thousand different processes. And some of those involve lu <laughs> extreme luck. I'm not saying there wasn't luck involved in the, in the early days either. Definitely was luck. But, but there was a lot more hoops to jump through. You guys know what I'm saying? 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and I think nowadays, if you jump through more hoops, you got to just jump through the right hoops. Because there's so many hoops that you can jump through these days that are just worthless. You can waste money. You can waste time. You can waste energy and go nowhere. Or you can go over here to this little thing. It's just so crazy because one hack that worked for somebody might not work for you. That's the problem. And, and so you have so many experts in every field because it worked. their tactic worked for them. But there's just so many thousands of those things that, okay, there's not one way to do it. I just got to figure out what works for me. You, 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 you've hit the nail on the head, mate, yeah. literally, because we, we get emails all the time. Like, do this, do this, like, come on this PR thing, blah, 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 blah. And like, yeah, it's all, it's, it's what works for someone doesn't work for another person. I, th I think a lot of it is luck, timing. Um, yeah, well, I think those are t the two main things, really, like luck and timing, like yeah. Yeah, right place, right time. So, yeah. You've got, we've got to be out there like playing and sort of getting face to face with people because a lot of people just, you know, like put music out online and it starts getting traction and thousands and thousands of listens. Whereas maybe people at record labels look at like the numbers a little bit too much instead of maybe I can work with this artist and there'll be like some longevity there. I think a lot of it now it's sort of kind of like flash in the pan, like it'll be good for like six months and then it will go away. Whereas we're kind of doing the complete opposite. We want to still be doing this in like 20 years time and still be relevant. And I think, um, and yeah, maybe sort of the, the tides will shift and labels or whoever will start looking, looking for people who that want that longevity, you know what I mean? And yeah, it's, it's, it's a different generation that we kind of grew up in. We like our, being our age. So we've sort of seen it how it was. And then obviously it's completely shifted to how it is now. Longevity, It's man. interesting. Yeah. It's, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I just want to comment, man, because that, that is, that's a huge, huge piece of the puzzle. Longevity and thinking about the future, forward thinking, so hard for people to do. And especially artists. Artists just want to get on that next tour. They want to just put out that next album. But like having having that mindset you guys is going to take you there you can't get to where you don't you you don't plan to go you know what i mean like you gotta you gotta work at it um you'll get yeah, somewhere if you don't plan you'll you'll end up somewhere it's usually not where you want to be right you'll be like a chinese weather balloon just flying aimlessly across the <laughs> you know what I'm saying? so i love that you guys so what's so you guys having that, I feel like you guys have have that in your songs, especially. You know, you can listen to your first album and it's timeless. Like, there's nothing that feels like, oh, this is pre-COVID or, you know, like, no, that, that that's not what it's about. Yeah, it's yeah, about, yeah. hey, you know what? There's a bunch of crazy situations that will come and go in our lives and we just have to work through it and adapt and we're still going to be here, you know. If you, you know, having that mindset is so important. I love it. Hundred percent, man. Yeah, man. Got to keep, keep, keep on, keep on going, keep on going. Um, are you excited for um when we were when we were young fest that line? Oh yeah, cool, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be a good time. Uh, I'm gonna be busy. I think I'm gonna be playing with Goldfinger. I assume both shows. Um, so it'll be. Two shows each day. Just have to time so can, it right. Can I, can I put you on the spot and ask you a very important question? Uh, sure. <laughs> Greendale, Greendale, Blink. Greendale. Okay, uh, this is tough. Um, for me, God, I, only, I grew up listening. I yeah. grew up listening to Green Day, and then yeah. I and I met Blink as as like another local. Like they were another band that like were 
in the scene. So like we were friends before I was fans of them. Um, yeah. But I, I like like the reason why we even met them was because I heard uh, Carousel. I didn't hear them play Carousel. I heard a band open for us at a party and they played Carousel. And I was like, that's a badass song. And I, and I was like talking to the guys and they're like, oh, this is a Blink-182 or at the time it was Blink. This is a Blink song. And like, who's Blink? We didn't know who they were because they were from San Diego. We're from Washington State up north. Um, and we were down in California, in Southern California, at a, playing a party, which is why they knew who Blink was. And turns out they were sort of just like another up and coming punk band like we were doing well. And, uh, and we went and saw them in Corona at the, um, at the, some theater in Corona. Anyway, uh, it was a cool experience. It was, it was cool to, to, to just like discover a band in such a weird way. But going back to Green Day, uh, we saw Green Day open for Bad Religion uh, before we were fans of Green Day uh, from their, uh, before Dookie came out. So from their earlier records. And so when they played a couple songs off Dookie, we we're like, dude, this is going to be a good record. And uh, they blew <clears throat> they blew Bad Religion off stage. It was insane. And, and of course, they've done that you know, to every band they've ever toured with. Uh, probably one of the most terrifying things we've ever done was, in, <laughs> was go on right after Green Day. We've done this a couple times, but I remember the first time we ever did yeah, it yeah. was Dallas, Texas at Warp Tour. Probably whatever Warp Tour that they were on. Uh, we were on as well, and we went on right after them on the main stage, and it was just like, that's not fair. That's just not fair. Every song they play <laughs> is like a giant hit. Oh, man. <laughs> but yeah, they're a great band. They're, they're really great. Good people. That that lineup stacked, man. That's going to be so much fun. You're going to have such a fucking great time. It's oh, like yeah. all the bat, all, all everyone's playing. So good times, good times ahead for sure. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm looking forward to the new record, whether it's called Wonder or not. We'll see. But uh, <laughs> let me know. I'll just I'll start beeping things, and uh, <laughs> we'll we'll get <laughs> like. Well, it was a one word title. I don't know what that could have been, but. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you guys coming back on, man. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank thanks for having us, Mike. Well. And thanks for, the, like, thanks for the kind words as well, man, and listening to our music. We really appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Uh, just so listeners can find you easier, what's the best way to find you online and find your music? Uh, Spotify and Instagram. And we have a website, lovebreakers.co.uk. Um, but yeah, every, everything's on there. Lovebreakers.co.uk. Yeah, you said a really that, cool website. You said that with an accent, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool, cool. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. Thank you so it, much, guys. Mike. Yeah, man. Let us know when Thank the record comes out, too. Let us know. I'll, uh, we'll do. Yeah. I'll post it. All right. Peace out. Love you guys. Cheers, Thanks, man. Thanks, man. See you later, dude. Bye, bye, bye.